Okay, everybody, we are going to get started with our last speaker of the day. So please welcome Emma Stegerwald. Okay, just a very quick introduction to, to Emma, because the last time I, I took half her talk. Um, but I just wanted to say that Emma's been with me um, since about 2018. So actually, just before the pandemic, she joined my lab, and she's co-advised with Rasmus Nielsen. And I should say that when Emma came in here, she she before she'd come to Berkeley, her career was pretty amazingly stellar. She got her undergraduate degree at Vanderbilt, and um, she became involved in just a mind-boggling number of different things. She was this Vanderbilt Biodiesel Initiative, the Alliance for Zero Extinction, um, the American Bird Conservancy. She was um, she she got involved in multiple different efforts, um, going to many different countries and um, starting to really get involved in conservation. And so she built up a, a really stellar record at Vanderbilt. And then she was thinking, you know, what should she do afterwards and she was kind of at, at the, the divide in the road and she was half thinking of going to vet school so she applied to um, the, the vet school at, at Cornell um, which is the best in the country as, as from as certainly when I went to Cornell they were very proud of their vet school so she applied there and she applied to Berkeley and of course she got into to both and she interviewed at, at Cornell um, but um, thankfully for us, she just decided to come here. And so she's, um, when, since she's been here, she's been working on um, on frogs in, the, in, um, in Peru in the very high mountains there. And she's gonna be talking a little bit about that work. Um, and I should say she's been just, uh, she's been really well funded, um, she, but, but that's because, you know, some people say that, well, you know, you're really lucky to get that amount of funding. For Emma, I have to say that she has applied relentlessly and tirelessly. And that's really what stands out from Emma's record is that she, um, she is incredibly dedicated and um, comes to everything, gets involved in everything. And in the nicest possible way, she has been, you know, she's been president and treasurer of the Society for Conservation Biology and the Berkeley chapter of that been involved in amphibia web. She's given talks in Spanish and English. She's chair of the DEI working group on translation for the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. She becomes, she gets involved in just everything, but in the nicest possible way. And so it's been such a pleasure to have you in the lab, Emma, and um, congratulations. Thank you. Hi. So, yeah, I'm very sorry that I'm arriving here kind of towards the end of the day. I had another event with um, I'm an affiliate with the MVZ and so I had to be up the hill at the bot garden, um, but really glad to to be here with you all um, and share an overview of my dissertation work. Um, so I'm calling this Glacier's Retreat, Frogs Advance, the Evolutionary Ecology of Climate Driven Range Shifts in Andean Amphibians. And I'll actually be filing this work in July. Um, that's not the advanced button. Max, yay. Okay, so click. Sounds good. Um, thank you. So um, all over the world, species of diverse taxa are undergoing both latitudinal and elevational rain shifts in response to climate change. And so here I am showing you plots from a number of kind of the iconic studies of these latitudinal and elevational rain shifts in different tax in different parts of the world. And while it's true that these rain shifts may better allow taxa to track the climatic conditions to which they evolved as they move across the landscape, my dissertation research has been motivated by my interest in the impacts that these rain shifts can have for the ecology and evolutionary trajectory of species at their expanding and contracting range edges. So better understanding what these evolutionary and ecological impacts are can help us better predict the implications of climate change for the persistence of biodiversity. <clears throat> 
And we do have a number of expectations for what the processes acting at these shift ranging margin, uh, shifting range margins are. And these are derived from studies of other sorts of distributional change scenarios. And I've been particularly interested in range expansions um, as opposed to contractions. So for example, we have studies of invasive species of range expansions across the landscape or the expansion of species out of ice age refugia. And so some of the impacts of rain shifts on evolutionary trajectories that we can expect to observe uh, come in the forms of, for example, decreased genetic diversity over the course of a range expansion. Uh, and essentially the reason that this happens is because when you have founders moving forwards on the expanding front of a range edge, they're essentially subsampling the total available genetic diversity in those source populations. And so you can see rather dramatic changes in the frequency of genetic variants over space. And you can also have the stochastic loss altogether of genetic variants from populations. Um, and because genetic diversity uh, is uh, provides the building blocks upon which evolution acts, this can have implications for the evolvability of species on changing range edges. Another thing we can expect to see is that species at expanding range fronts are being exposed to novel suites of environmental conditions. And if they're going to colonize those conditions successfully, they will need to adapt to those new conditions. And then we can also expect that range expansions can have implications for wildlife movement across the landscape and thus for patterns of gene flow. And this is important for the evolutionary trajectory of species in the respects that gene flow is the process by which a mutation that arises in some part of a species range is able to travel throughout the rest of the species range and be made available as a potentially adaptive mutation for animals living in some other part of a species range. So I'm not gonna talk about this ecological component because we uh, do have limited time today, but to study the evolutionary and ecological impacts of climate change driven rain shifts, I chose to work in the Cordillera Virgenata, which is a portion of the uh, Eastern Andes in Southern Peru that during the Little Ice Age, so that was a period of glacial expansion that lasted from about 1300 until about 1850, formed a continuously glaciated barrier across the landscape. But since then, in the last 150 years, the Vilcanota has been rapidly deglaciating. And for example, this mountain pass that I'm featuring here, Oshoyo, um, this pass only deglaciated to the extent that it formed a continuous terrestrial corridor between habitats to the south and the north of these mountains in about the year 1980. So this is a very young landscape. And into this very young deglaciated landscape have moved these three beautiful species of frogs. I'm seeing some smiles and giggles. They're very cute species. Um, and they've been expanding their upslope elevational range into this newly deglaciated habitat. And in so doing, they have encountered a number of extreme selective pressures. So on the one hand, they have become the highest elevation amphibians anywhere in the world. So they now occur hundreds of meters higher, for example, than any of the amphibian species in the Himalayas. And another selective pressure that we know they've been coping with is the introduction of Betragochytrium dendrobotitis, or BD, the devastating fungal pathogen of amphibians, which began driving die-offs in this zone in the um, early 2000s. So um, I'm not going to talk as much about this portion of my work now because it relates to how rain shifts affect the ecology of species, but I welcome your questions about this topic um, afterwards, or you can come find me and chat to me about it. Uh, so the parts uh, of my dissertation work that I'm going to mention today have to do with the genomic signature of climate change driven range expansion. So what happens to genetic diversity when species are undergoing these really rapid contemporary climate change driven uh, changes of distribution? And then have frogs over this very, very recent history undergone accelerated genetic adaptation to extreme high elevation. 
uh, again, they've only had 150 years and some of this landscape has only opened up to them in the last 40 years. So in order to address these questions, I assembled an annotated genome for the marbled spore-eyed frog. Uh, so this was the species that I was able to most regularly sample across the landscape. And I resequenced 192 individuals from across this landscape, basically to do landscape gen uh, genetic work, to do population genetics. So here I'm showing you the study landscape, and those black points are places from which I resequenced the whole genomes of frogs. The white polygons are the current glacial extent in the Vilganata, so of course it's continuing to shrink every year. And you can see that I did much more concentrated sampling along those mountain passes because those are the very young landscapes that frogs have expanded into and colonized over just the last 150 years. So to address this first question, what happens to genetic diversity over the course of a climate change driven range expansion? First, we need to actually establish what these colonization fronts are. Um, so what I mean by that is, did frogs colonize these mountain passes bidirectionally, moving from both the north and the south of the mountains? Or did they sweep from one side of the mountains and colonize the habitat on the other side of the mountains just within this 150 year time frame? And the reason I'm asking that question is made more evident if we consider the longer history of this landscape. So in black, I'm showing you South America. The gray polygon is showing you the distribution of the marbled spore-eyed frog, and the white polygons are showing you glacial extent during the last glacial maximum, which lasted until about 21,000 years ago. And that red bounding box is showing you the location of my study landscape, and you can see that it sits right on the edge of the distribution for this species and for the other two frog species that I study, in fact. And it's so close to the edge of this frog's range that during the last glacial maximum, again, that white polygon is ice extent of these expanding glaciers, that northern part of the landscape would have been entirely uninhabitable to them. But I don't know whether this may have also been the case during the Little Ice Age, that period from 1300 until 1850. Because if that were the case, and watersheds to the north of the mountains were uninhabitable for these frogs during that time period, then most likely frogs would have colonized northwards coming from the south, and the mountain passes would be colonized in that south to north direction. And to begin to answer this question, we can look at genetic structure on the landscape. So given the passage of enough evolutionary time, we expect watersheds to shape genetic structure for frogs. Uh, and the reason for this is that watersheds tend to shape movement for a lot of amphibian species. So here I'm showing you the three major watersheds on the study landscape in different colors. And um, so if we see evidence for genetic structure, this suggests a longer history of these amphibians in each of these watersheds. If we don't see genetic structure and they're pretty genetically homogenous, they've probably just swept from one part of the landscape to another in the very recent um, past, so in these past 150 years. So here I'm showing you the results of an Ohana analysis of ancestry components, which is basically a way to look at genetic structure. And along the X axis, you have different individual frogs. Those are the different columns and they're clumped by the watershed from which frogs were sampled. So the Southern pink watershed, the Eastern green watershed and the Western purple watershed. And then you can see the results of the analysis for different numbers of ancestry components that we can model. So I'm showing you results for two, three, four, five, and six ancestry components. And uh, let's just examine this iteration at k is equal to three ancestry components. And you see that a single ancestry component, so basically a single kind of um, genetic ancestry tends to dominate in each of these different watershed groups. And I've colored this plot so that it corresponds to the watersheds that you're seeing on the map. And these different watershed populations are well supported by an analysis of molecular variants, and they're well differentiated from one another with FST statistics. And so this extent of genetic structuring in the data is highly suggestive of frogs having been in that northern part of the landscape, the purple and green watersheds during the Little Ice Age from 1300 to 1850. Um, 
But in order to really corroborate whether this was in fact the case, I wanted to model the population history of these frogs. And so I used GADMA to differentiate between a suite of different population history models. And so on this plot on the right, what I'm going to show you on the x-axis is the effective population size of um, these frog populations. On the y-axis, you see time before the present in thousands of years. And then those blue blocks represent periods of glacial expansion. And so the best supported uh, population history model shows us frogs coming from the western watershed. And we see the first split occurring for these frogs after a period of glacial expansion that would have lasted in this zone from about 52,000 until about 39,000 years ago. And you can see that the effective population size of the western watershed is larger than that of the southern watershed after this split, which seems to indicate that founding populations from the western watershed moved into that uh, from the Western watershed moved into that Southern watershed and colonized it. The next period after which we have a split is just after the last glacial maximum, which again ended about 21,000 years ago in this landscape. And this makes really good sense, again, looking back at this map of what was happening during the LGM, because that Eastern watershed, again, that I've been showing in green in these plots, would have been entirely uninhabitable for frogs during the last glacial maximum. So we finally have an answer as to an unambiguous answer into what the colonization front exactly is. It's a bi-directional colonization front um, for these mountain passes where frogs would have been living in all three of these watersheds during the little ice age from 1300 until 1850 and would have been colonizing these mountain passes over the last 150 years from both directions. So, this is backed up if we project ancestry components onto the landscape. And what you see are these really steep climbs in ancestry components along the course of these mountain passes. And where you see that really sharp turnover in ancestry components in this younger pass, Oshoyo, the long one to the left, corresponds exactly with where the most recent deglaciation happened in the past. So where frogs would have had the first opportunity to meet and breed. So it seems clear that frogs were in all of these watersheds during the Little Ice Age, have colonized these mountain passes from both directions, but then they've had this opportunity to interbreed with frogs from very differentiated populations. So we expect this to boost population genetic diversity. So does this signal of admixture then obscure any signal we would expect to otherwise see uh, of a genomic expansion where we'd expect to see declining genetic diversity because we've had this really cool opportunity for a diversity boost mid-pass. And the answer is no, we still see declining genetic diversity along mountain passes. So here I'm showing you the inbreeding coefficient uh, interpolated across the landscape. And so areas that are shown in warm colors essentially correspond to areas of really high genetic diversity. So this makes really good sense because we know that frogs ancestrally were coming from the West when they first colonized this landscape. And then that area in blue is showing the area with the lowest genetic diversity on this landscape. And that corresponds to where frogs have only relatively recently in evolutionary time been able to colonize and live. And you can see that there's this really warm point in genetic diversity at Oshoyo Pass in the zone where deglaciation most recently opened up this pass and where frogs would have had the opportunity to meet and breed in the middle. And if we look at inbreeding coefficient for individual frogs across these two black dotted lines that I'm showing you for Oshoyo Pass on the left and Chimboya Pass on the right, what you essentially see is that you have the inbreeding coefficient increasing in both directions as you move towards the center of the pass before it declines mid-pass. And that point where inbreeding coefficient is really low, that would represent areas of higher genetic diversity, would um, correspond to areas of putative secondary contact between frogs meeting and breeding from northern and southern watersheds. Um, skip over this. So we do see declines in genetic diversity over the course of range expansion, but we also see some opportunities for new gene flow across the landscape that can also 
restore genetic diversity in some cases. And who knows, maybe um, in some circumstances provide opportunities for genetic rescue to genetically depleted populations. So do we see accelerated genetic adaptation to extreme high elevation? Um, I'm not going to talk through these plots in detail, but uh, what I just want you to take you to take away from this is that extreme high elevations um, present a whole suite of really challenging conditions for organisms to overcome. And specifically, I'm showing you information about the thermal environment that these frogs are experiencing. So along our x-axis, we have elevation. And along our y-axis on this plot on the bottom, which is the one we'll focus on for now, is the proportion of time that frogs are spending um, at conditions that exceed their critical thermal limits. Um, and so, of course, frogs can move on the landscape, but I'm measuring temperature at these sites with eye buttons, which are staying stationary in place, so they're not able to moderate their environment. Um, but you can see basically that frogs would be exposed to their critical thermal limits much more frequently at extreme high elevation. And this is particularly true for terrestrially living frogs. So aquatic environments do tend to thermal organisms from extreme thermal changes, uh, but terrestrial environments do not. Um, and so uh, the marbled four-eyed frog, it's worth noting, is fully terrestrial as a, mature, a sexually mature adult. So that would be relevant for them. They're really coming up upon their physiological limits at extreme high elevation. So I looked at um, what might be uh, genetic variants underlying rapid genetic adaptation to elevation. So I use redundancy analysis to identify genetic variants that are kind of excessively associated with elevation in my data. And so here I'm showing you a plot of um, what some of those outliers look like. So this is known as a Manhattan plot. So we have position along the genome on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we're seeing loadings along environmental axes for different genetic variants. And so this black dotted line horizontally across the plot is our threshold for statistical significance. And then those uh, points that are floating above that line are genetic variants that really seem to be strongly associated with extreme high elevation. And there are a bunch of variants on this plot, and I'm just going to um, highlight a few of them here. Uh, generally, these candidate SNPs are associated with functions in hematopoiesis, which is the formation of the components of blood and blood plasma. They're associated with neovascularization, which is the growth of new vasculature to oxygen uh, to tissues that have poor oxygen delivery. Um, and then there are many, many variants, and the three that I'm highlighting here are ones that are associated with response to oxidative stress, response to hypoxia. So over and over again in studies of extreme high elevation populations, hypoxia, which is very low partial oxygen pressures and basically oxygen deprivation to the cell, is a really consistent, um, important stressor that animals are needing to adapt to if they're going to colonize high elevation environments. So these three variants that I'm highlighting here are ones that we know are associated with um, the cell's response to hypoxia and oxidative stress. And just um, taking again, this uh, profile of these three uh, really interesting points, um, we can look at how they change in frequency over the course of the elevation elevational gradient that I sampled. So we have elevational intervals on the x-axis in this plot. On the y-axis, we see the frequency at which a variant occurs in the population for each of these genes of interest. And you can see really rapid change of the frequency of these variants over elevation. And it's just really extreme because you can see that the genetic variant that is less frequent at low elevations becomes the predominant variant at high elevations. So you can look at what these uh, these genes look like on the landscape. So in these pie charts, I'm showing you the frequency of each of the alternate variants for one of the particular um, genes of interest. And you can see once again that this um, the variant that is the low frequency variant at low elevations becomes the predominant variant at high elevations. It's worth notice, noticing that the elevational bands that frogs have colonized in this landscape over just the past 150 years is the one that I'm highlighting here in blue. So 
we basically see that the variants that are rising to incredibly high frequency over the course of this very recent spatial expansion are variants that were already circulating in the population at lower elevations. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to just think about the longer history of this landscape. So remember the demography plot that I showed you, the population history plot that showed those periods of glacial expansion and contraction on the Y axis. So we've had many iterative periods of glacial expansion and contraction in this in this landscape. And we know that frogs have been in this landscape longer than just this most recent period of glacial expansion and contraction. And so um, one idea would be that the reason that these variants are circulating in lower elevations in this population is that there have been many episodes in the past where frogs have needed to expand upslope, and these variants have been useful in the past and are retained and circulating in the population. Um, so I've just um, done a few tests for selection with uh, my data uh, to date, and what I'm doing this summer is corroborating that I find these same loci using other independent tests so we can feel really confident that they are indeed associated with high elevation adaptation. And then in order to test this hypothesis that potentially it's these episodic uh, moments of expansion upslope and contraction downslope that have retained these variants in the population, we can look at what kind of selection is acting on these loci. In that case, we would expect it to be uh, balancing selection. So we can see evidence that these variants um, have been uh, under this kind of fluctuating, temporally fluctuating selection in the past. Alternatively, if they've just risen to frequency in this last 150 years through a selective sweep, that signature would look quite distinct. Um, so we do see evidence for accelerated genetic adaptation to extreme high elevation. Um, yeah, and that's uh, all I'll cover today. Thanks so much for being here. And yeah, I look forward to any questions. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, really, really nice. I, 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 this last part that you're talking about, the different variants in the specific loci, that you make me believe that they are really highly adaptive for that specific condition of low oxygen and all that. Um, it's, in, it's incredible. The, the differences are so incredible. And it makes me wonder your density, population density or abundance, must not be very high. This, I mean, what's the what's the frequency of frogs per square mile? I don't know. I imagine it's not very high. How do you presume such a fast and radical uh, sorting um, is happening? Any any mechanism suggested? Is it happening at the gamete level? Is it happening in the you know egg or zygote? And how? How do you imagine this physiologically translating into such a strong signal of selection, of neg negative selection in both ways, right? Because you have negative selection at the low altitude or lower altitude against one of the variants without killing it out, and then really hard negative selection in the higher altitude for the other one. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's a really striking signal. Um, I would have imagined the same thing that I would be dealing with very few frogs. Um, so I don't have kind of formal um, surveys that would allow me to test whether frog abundance declines along the um, elevational expansion front. What I do have as a proxy of that where I have um, uh, we have kind of controlled search effort at different sites, and we know how many sexually mature adults versus juveniles, tadpoles, we found at each site. And so of the three species I studied, I was able to, to test for all three, three species um, whether abundance might decline at high elevation with this proxy. And we do see a strong signal for the toad that I studied, Ren um, uh, Renella spinulosa, for the other two species, including the one that I featured in these analyses um, these genomic analyses, I don't actually see a signal of declining abundance with high elevation. And also anecdotally, it, it doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. 
um, when when you're actually in the fields, uh, which very much surprised me because I, I I thought like it must be the case. It's extreme. Um, it's an extreme environment. I guess one thought I have about that is that you know this difference between realized and fundamental niche, and basically these glaciers are covering portions of what would otherwise be the frog's fundamental niche physiologically in terms of at least thermal conditions. They seem incredibly robust to the thermal conditions at extreme high elevation. Um, so clearly hypoxia is a huge challenge for them. Um, I'd, it, it is really interesting and also surprising to me that, as you say, these variants appear to be under negative selection at lower elevations because they're at very low frequency at those low, low elevations. Um, so these are really important pathways in the cell that these, these genes are involved in. Uh, so, uh, so for example, the hypoxia inducible, um, factor pathway is a pathway that controls a lot of cellular processes in an oxygen dependent fashion. So based on oxygen concentration in a cell, um, this pathway can get turned on or off. And this has been consistently identified as a pathway really important in high elevation adaptation and is also a pathway that is, is associated with many of the candidates that I found. Um, and so I guess part of the reason potentially where you, why you have this negative selection for these variants at low elevation is just these are really fundamental cellular processes that are driving a lot of the cell's activities. Um, and, and so a change in a component that's relating to that pathway has kind of many rippling effects. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in whether we continue to see these same candidate genes being really highly supported by other independent tests for selection. Um, because yeah, I was, I was also surprised by the strength of those, um, those signals. It's really cool, but it's worth noting as well that using a whole genome approach, I started with 16 million SNPs. Uh, variable sites that were very highly supported as being variable sites in the genome. That's like filtering out things that potentially it's just sequencing or whatever. So I have a lot of information I'm dealing with. So you're always going to expect to see outliers in that. Um, and so one thing that happens with spatial expansion is that you see um, gene surfing just due to genetic drift at the expansion front. So it's possible that like a gene surfing type effect would exacerbate a signal that we would see um, just from selection and kind of make for an incredibly strong signal. Um, and I'm interested in learning how to better piece apart that demographic versus that selection signal with this data. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, okay, I have a question, just some curiosity about if there's any morphological changes you were seeing as well as they went higher. Yeah. Okay. If you would like to share that. Um, also something that I really expected to see is, yeah, you expect to see potentially larger individuals that are more robust to periods of food scarcity, uh, that are maybe less prone to, um, tissue damage, um, with cold weather, you might expect to see shorter limbs. I didn't measure limb length because, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty and all that. Um, body size, I did measure, and I don't see a significant effect of body size um, along the elevational gradient. But I'm only measuring a portion of these frogs' elevational gradient, the up slope side. Um, I'm not measuring the complete sweep of their elevational um, range. So maybe if I did, I would see a significant signal. Um, it does seem that within at least the range that I have, that the um, it's kind of more subtle physiological things that are changing, um, such as, for example, um, uh, presumably their blood chemistry with a lot of the changes we're seeing is changing like their hematocrit, um, like uh, red blood cell count, things like that um, are likely to be changing based on the pathways we're identifying as being under selection. But yeah, no obvious morphological changes, definitely behavioral ones. Um, I, I, I think um, sheltering from UV, sheltering from aridifying, uh, really drying winds. Uh, yeah, but great question. Thank you so much. Thank you.